Malware tech pleads not guilty, fake cell phone towers can outsmart detection apps, and hackers encode malware into DNA. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morris and this is ThreatWire for August 15, 2017. Your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. If you haven't checked out our Patreon yet, please do so. We have lots that we want to do for this show, but we can't do it without your support. Patreon.com slash ThreatWire is the place to support ThreatWire and the link is in the show notes. And now, on to the news. We have got an update on Malware Tech Blog's case. Marcus Hutchins was arrested right after DEF CON in relation to the banking malware from 2014 called Kronos. For the full story, please see last week's episode of ThreatWire. I have the link in the show notes to that as well. His court date was scheduled for last week but was postponed till Monday, August 14th. During the hearing, Hutchins pleaded not guilty to creating Kronos malware. Hutchins' lawyer, Brian Klein, said he was not guilty of the six charges and they renegotiated his terms of release. Originally, after he got out on bail, he would not be allowed internet access. He is now allowed access to continue his work, but he cannot access his want to cry sinkhole. He also has to be tracked by GPS and he cannot leave the United States. Hutchins is currently relocating to Los Angeles, which is also where the company he works for is located at. He will be represented by both Brian Klein and Marsha Hoffman, who was formerly with the EFF and was interviewed by Hack5 several years ago. Both Klein and Hoffman are outstanding lawyers and, according to Hoffman's statements to the press, once more evidence comes to light, they believe that he will be fully vindicated. His trial is set for October 23rd, and until then, we can expect a bit of snark via his Twitter account now that he's allowed on the internet again. It's almost like it's 1995 all over again. IMSI catchers, also known as Stingray devices, are malicious fake cell phone towers that can act like real towers, allowing your phone to connect to them. Once your smartphone connects, data can be compromised and spied on. Many of these Stingray devices will do so by dropping your connection to something less secure than LTE, be it 2G, 3G, or 4G connections. Several different applications available across Android's Google Play Store have been created to detect these Stingrays, but unfortunately, much like antivirus apps on Android, they don't hold up to their promises. Several researchers from Oxford University and the Technical University of Berlin wrote a research paper on their findings and how they were able to trick the apps into thinking a Stingray device was a legit tower. The researchers planned to give a talk on their findings on Monday during the Usenix workshop on offensive technologies. Of the five applications they studied, which were called Snoop Snitch, Cell Spy Catcher, GSM Spy Finder, Darshak, and AIMSICD, all five were circumvented. Each of these is supposed to alert you via notification whenever a fake cell phone tower is recognized, but unfortunately, that was not the case. The researchers built their own Stingray device while keeping it contained in a Faraday cage, so not to intercept any kind of innocent nearby devices. The device is made up of an embedded PC, and it kind of looks like a Raspberry Pi or a similar device from the photos, and a USRP, which stands for Universal Software Radio Peripheral, both of which cost together a few hundred bucks. They use several different modes to get a smartphone to connect to the device, and as such, determine which apps would notify them of the Stingray. While the apps could see if a fake tower was recently created, if it sent a silent text, or if it dropped the signal using one downgrade technique, the apps did not notice the Stingray if they used alternate techniques to connect to the phone, making a silent call instead of a text to find the IMSI, using a different technique to downgrade to 2G, or imitating real local towers so that the Stingray doesn't look like a new one, were all successful in their tests. They also used authentication token replay techniques, zero security, and location leaks, which successfully connected with no indication from the apps. The full report is linked below. One of these applications was created by a researcher, and two didn't respond when Wired asked them for comment. GSM Spy Finder disputed the research findings, and Cell Spy Catcher said the most common modes of Stingrays would be discovered by his application. Unfortunately, though, much of the underlying issues rely on phone manufacturers and chipset manufacturers coming to their senses about the problems that Stingray devices have shown. Most, if not all, of the issues cannot be modified or 
are fixed by an application, and applications are used merely as band-aids for a much larger problem. As I have mentioned before, security is kind of like a tennis match. The ball changes courts between the attacker and a developer multiple times until eventually one of them is going to win. A group of researchers from the University of Washington is also presenting findings on Thursday at the USENIX Security Conference about being able to encode malicious software in strands of DNA. What? Apparently this is a thing. When physical strands of DNA are analyzed using a gene sequence analyzer, a computer is used to turn that data into bits that can be researched further to develop cures and further medicine and stuff like that. The researchers found that they can also code malicious data into the DNA so that when the analyzer looks at it, the malicious code attacks the underlying computer and infects it. The researchers used ASCII strings of A's, T's, C's, and G's from the DNA strand to create binary output from 176 letters total. They took advantage of a buffer overflow to get the sequence to read the exploit and use the bash shell to connect to a remote server. Now, while I do not fully comprehend the details to encode malicious data into physical DNA, since I was a total fail at chemistry, I'll just be honest right there, they were able to successfully do so and such. Once sequencing in an analyzer happened, the exploit could expand from a digital subset from there. Similar techniques have been used in recent past to encode automated GIFs or GIFs, depending on who you are, and text into physical DNA. The attack worked 37% of the time, and the researchers used some creative liberty to even make that successful. During the process, they did find some other vulnerabilities in software commonly used for gene sequencing, showing that security was definitely not the main thought when developing these products. The researchers do not see this as a viable attack vector at this time, but it could be used in the near future as more and more analysis is done by third-party vendors of DNA DNA or for criminal cases. Thank you again to all you mighty fine people who contribute to patreon.com slash threatwire. You are the reason that we can keep on bringing you news every single week. Any little bit helps us grow the show and in return, you will get access to a whole bunch of extras on Patreon that are just for patrons. We might even feature your adorable fur baby in an upcoming episode like this brand new one. Check out the perk levels on Patreon and thank you again for helping us keep this show completely independent and ad free. Of course, if you cannot donate, you can hit the subscribe subscribe button or you can share this episode on your favorite social media page and use that hashtag threatwire so that we can see it and I'll retweet you. And with that, I'm Shannon Morse and I will see you on the internet.